Okay, so this is an assignment where we get to play with toys. And usually you'd be doing this, which would be more fun, of course. But it helps us understand the geometry of molecules, what molecules are shaped like. Okay, the ones that get into the molecule club, of course, according to the rules of thumb, should be non-metals because you need to have covalent bonds. So non-metals form covalent bonds for the most part. And that is true because the difference of electronegativity, the difference of electronegativity between any two non-metals is never going to be big enough to make an ionic bond. So it is true that non-metals can only make covalent bonds between each other, between two non-metals. But it turns out the only exceptions to that, well, you do get a few metals that will make covalent bonds with non-metals as well. So that's why I say that rule of thumb isn't, it's true, but there can be other ways of forming covalent bonds, okay? So what do you need to put on your molecule models sheet? Well, you have to fit quite a lot of things in here. So make sure not to do anything too big. Use the example as a model of how big to make it. And please answer these little questions. They're kind of easy once you've seen the model. It should be, it, you should be able to answer those based on the models that you make. Okay? So these are the things we need. Lewis structures. That's like that. I'll show you how to come up with those. Okay? You need a sketch of the model. That's like that. Okay? A little sketch of what it actually looks like when you built it. Okay? Um, and that should be small. Stable, unstable, or very stable. Well, you know what? Molecules are probably going to be stable. You can assume that they'll all be stable unless there's any of these little pegs left over. Okay? That would be unstable. And then if you have triple bonds or double bonds, let's just say very stable. That'd be harder to break apart. Okay? Lower potential energy. So the Vesper form is based on the notes on Vesper. So the Vesper form just sort of tells you the shape of the molecule. So you should be able to see it when we build it and then think about what do we call that? What's the generic formula like this? And then what do, what do we call that shape? Is it linear? This is linear, by the way. Is it tetrahedral? Okay, some molecules are shaped like a four-sided die. Some molecules are shaped like a peanut. Okay? So, and then polarity of each bond, that's the... That's something you have to calculate using the electronegativity table. You subtract between every two members of a compound, each side, like I would subtract the nitrogen and the hydrogen right there. And then remember what the electronegativity difference means. It's the difference that actually matters. It's the difference of electronegativity. So is it between 0 and 0.5? Is it between 0.5 and 2.1? Or is it between 2.1 and 3.3? Well, by the way, we probably won't see any of that because these are molecules, right? No ions allowed. So if you get something over here probably wrong, probably going to be either nonpolar or polar. So you can just write nonpolar or polar. And then the hardest thing about this assignment is determining whether if it's got nonpolar bonds, that's easy. Then the molecule is nonpolar for sure. If it's only nonpolar bonds, then the molecule is nonpolar, easy. But if it has polar bonds, if it has polar bonds, then you have to figure out, would these cancel each other out? Because if polar bonds are directly opposite, if they're arranged directly opposite each other, they will cancel out and you will get a nonpolar molecule. So that's the trickiest part of this whole assignment. The main reason we do this is to get some practice with Lewis structures. Lewis structures are where you put together the Lewis dots. You take the Lewis dots of different elements and you put them, well not neon because it doesn't make molecules, and put them together into a compound. Okay, put it together into the structure of the molecule. And then you can use the Lewis structures, the Lewis structure like that, to predict the shape of the molecule. That's Vesper. Okay, so there's a bunch of things to this, but mainly, again, it's playing with toys. It's just an excuse to play with toys. Remember that electrons don't like each other. They find each other literally repulsive. 
Okay, they stay away from each other, but they can have two different spins. So what you wind up getting is two electrons sharing a volume, and they have both of the spins. But then if you have two other pairs, two other electrons, another pair, well, they don't want to be anywhere near each other. They push each other whoosh, as far apart as they can. And that's why molecules sometimes have this shape. Because if you have two pairs of electrons, whoosh, they get 180 degrees apart. All right? Interestingly, electrons are named after the amber they can be easily rubbed off. The first time electrons were observed was when they rubbed fur on amber, which is basically like a tree resin, kind of like sap. Like, did you ever see Jurassic Park? That's what the mosquito was in. That was amber. Okay, that's where we get the color amber. It's the color of that resin. See, there's a little mosquito trapped in the background there. Um, and so the word electron in Greek means amber. And so that gave rise to the word electric. It's a long story. But electrons are named after amber, interestingly, right? Weird. So electrons don't like each other. So what you got to figure out is how many pairs of electrons are we going to have? Well, usually, most things want to have an octet. So usually that would be four pairs. If you spread out four pairs as far as they can get, you wind up with a tetrahedron. So a tetrahedron is actually one of the fundamental shapes of molecules. This is a four-sided die because it has one, two, three, and then, of course, the bottom. Okay, it's not like a pyramid in Egypt, but it is kind of a pyramid shape. It's one of the most perfect shapes in geometry. Other than the sphere itself, this is probably the next most perfect shape. Beautiful, beautiful. Every side, equilateral triangle. Four of them. Every angle, 60 degrees. 60 degrees, 60 degrees, 60 degrees. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay. So we're going to do the first example. And I'm going to move this out of the way so that we have more room. And I'm going to put this over here. Okay, so now when we're talking about molecule models, what we are using are these little guys. Okay. So you can sort of see what they represent. Let me put this one on here too. You can sort of see what the molecule models represent. Each of these is an atom. And why does it have a peg? Well, the hole doesn't mean anything. The hole is just the way they make them. That's just a defect. But the peg definitely means something. That means an unpaired valence electron. They don't bother showing you if there's any paired valence electrons like those. Those would not be shown. Okay, this of course is Hydrogen, hydrogen is yellow. So hydrogen only has one electron. Well, that's what that peg represents. If hydrogen is going to ever become stable, then that peg needs to go into a bond. It absolutely needs to. Okay? So we'll see that when we get to hydrogen. Hydrogen is not in the example, so I'll do that one second. Okay? Then we've got oxygen. So why does oxygen have two pegs? Well, because, look, oxygen... Oxygen has two unpaired electrons, okay? That's what the pegs are. Those are pairs. Those do not show up on the model, okay? So that's why oxygen looks like that. Okay, and notice how they're arranged. They're arranged at that exact angle that the bond forms. So the geometries of these are based, what they really did honestly for these, just to make things easy, they took a tetrahedral form, like the carbon, and then they trimmed it down. So that's really how they made this. So they probably didn't get the exact 104.5. This is probably 109.5. But it's close enough at this distance, we can't really see the difference. So technically, it should be a slight, probably like 5 degrees narrower. But it's a pretty good model. These work pretty well. Okay? And then nitrogen, of course. Note, notice that nitrogen needs three pegs because it has three, boom, 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 unpaired electrons. That's what those pegs represent. Notice that it does not have one on the top, right? because that would be this pair. That would be like right there, located right there. Okay, and then of course we've got carbon. Carbon has all four. Okay, that's the tetrahedral form. Now notice that those four are as far apart from each other as they could possibly get. That's why we wind up with that tetrahedral angle, 109.5 degrees, because that's as far apart as four pairs of electrons can get in three dimensions. As for anything can get in three dimensions. So that's just what you wind up with. It doesn't sound like a good number. Um, and again, this is like, look, this is just like an upside down one of these, okay? It's just like the four-sided die, see, see the similarity.
So what we're going to do, we're going to take out the ones we need for the, for the example first. O2, what does that mean? The subscript is how many you have. O is oxygen. So let me get bung, bung, two oxygen. So these are incredibly unstable. These are atoms of oxygen. There's no way you're ever going to find these because this is not going to work. They don't have the octet. Okay, what do they need? They each need two more electrons to get an octet. So they can do that by making a bond. The way we show the bonds is with these straws. These straws represent covalent bonds. Let me make sure to get a good skinny one here. Okay, and if I put that on there, and then if I put that on there, notice that they've each contributed, they've each contributed a electron, an unpaired electron to that bond. So now that represents a covalent bond between the two oxygen. But clearly this is a problem. Okay, this is what we would call a radical, a free radical, because it has unpaired electrons. This is not at all stable. So this would be unstable, but this is not going to be acceptable. This is not what we're going to draw on paper, because there's another way that they can satisfy their octet. They can make another bond. If nothing else is around, they can just make this. So this represents the double bond between two oxygen. There you go. So oxygen, okay, looks like this. This is really what the molecule looks like. Two oxygen atoms double bonded together covalent bonds. So I could draw a little sketch of that. Oh, there it is. There's my little sketch. Okay. Um, do you think this is, a, this is stable? Yes, it is stable. Now, obviously, oxygen has lots of chemical reactions because it can find better pairings. Okay, but this is stable. And then what's the Vesper form? Well, doesn't this look a little bit like a peanut? Maybe not at first glance, but if you were to, if you were to draw, if you were to show the oxygen molecule this way, doesn't that look a little bit like a peanut? That's a peanut shaped. So what do we call those? All those peanut ones, those are A2 linear. That's the Vesper form. So for the Vesper form, notice it says A2 linear. I got it from this. And notice anything that's A2, it's not just oxygen. Anything that's A2 is A2 linear. That's the really the only thing you can do. With two points, all you can get is a straight line. Now notice that the bonds seem to bend around that. And that looks kind of chintzy, kind of like a cheap toy. Is this a cheap toy? Why do those bonds bend like that? But actually what that does is it draws them closer together. Look at the distance apart. Look at the distance they are apart when there's a single bond, okay? Look at that distance. But then look, when we bend it, don't they get closer together, a little bit closer together, right? And that's exactly what we see with a double bond. They do wind up getting closer together. Remember, shorter bonds are stronger bonds. And of course, double bonds, are you can just see that they're stronger visually. Okay, so that's the oxygen molecule, and I can show it with I can show it with these other models. In this one, oxygen is red. Now, on this key, because of the ones that we had at our school, I decided to make uh, nitrogen red and oxygen blue, just because those are the ones we already have. But traditionally, what they usually use is red for oxygen. So if you look things up, you'll probably find red oxygen. I'd like you to use the ones, the colors that I'm using here. It's better if you can do these in color, by the way, the drawings, color coded, okay? So blue for oxygen, try to use this key. But on the bigger ones, um, on the bigger ones, oxygen is red. Now, if we, the problem with these ball and stick models is that the, the sticks are not flexible, so it's really hard to make a double bond, right? So that would be a single bond, that's not gonna work, okay? So what they have to do for these is you have to use a spring to represent the bond. So that would be a single bond. And then this would make it a double bond. Okay, so that's the bigger model. But I'd like you to draw this one instead. Keep the color coding that we use um, for these models. So oxygen molecule, and of course, they really oscillate like this. This is kind of a cool model, and uh, they kind of oscillate all the time. And if you heat them up too much, if you add too much energy, then those bonds, of course, can break. And when they formed, they already released some energy, okay? So those are two ways of showing oxygen. Now, what about the Lewis structure? We didn't see the Lewis structure for oxygen. Well, here's oxygen on here, okay? So let's see what its Lewis structure is. I might have to, I'll put it right on top of this. Okay, for the Lewis structure, 
Let me get two oxygen here. Now remember, oxygen has six valence electrons, and you can arrange them like this, okay? So here is an oxygen molecule, just like that. But you could arrange it any which way you want. You could have it like that. And I guess in this case, what I'm gonna do, so let me move this out of the way, okay? Let's put this oxygen, and then uh, let me just turn this one like upside down. Now these electrons might be upside down, but because they're gonna form obviously a bond between them. And then those two can go into a bond, and I'm gonna show my covalent bonds with these orange guys. That would be like the dash. But then, wait a second, we've still got these two unpaired electrons, so what we need to do there is we need to put them both into a second bond between the oxygen. So then those two are now included in that bond. So what we usually do is we don't, uh, we just erase those and we draw the bond. I don't want you to just show four electrons here between them, because that is not clear that you understand what a bond is. So the way that you would show this if you drew this, it would be like that. And it doesn't exactly matter which side these are on. These could be up there. These could be down there. It doesn't really matter as long as this is a pair and this is a pair together. Okay? And then we have these two bonds. So notice that we've got these count each as two. This is a pair of electrons being shared. Two, four, six, eight octet. Two, four, six, eight octet. So they have a satisfied octet, and there it is right there. So you draw it, it doesn't have to be with red dots, it can be just black dots, just make sure they're very clear and that they're paired together on one side. Think of it as like a square with four sides. And using that, you could actually predict this shape because basically those bonds, okay, are trying to get as far away as possible from these electrons, but since there's only two nuclei, there's only two points, there's really only one geometry and of course that is linear. That is what we call A2 linear, okay, the Vesper form. Okay, so for the other ones, I'm not gonna do your Lewis structures, but just remember that you take the Lewis dots that are from here, like hydrogen, and here's hydrogen, and again, it doesn't matter which side it's on, okay, or carbon, okay, it has four, right, or nitrogen, and you take the Lewis dots that they have, and you make the molecule out of it. You put it together into the molecule. All right. So for the other ones, I'm not going to do the Lewis structures for you. But notice one thing about this I should have mentioned is that, isn't it interesting what we have? Carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, well, fluorine. I don't think that's actually on this sheet, but we might have fluorine. These are all what? These are all on a particular part of the periodic table. These are all nonmetals. And doesn't that make sense based on our rule of thumb? Because we're making molecules, right? We're making molecules. And the rule of thumb is that nonmetals make covalent bonds. Covalent bonds are in molecules. Okay, for oxygen, the polarity of this bond, the polarity of these bonds, well, they would be the same because they're between two oxygen. You only have to calculate it once between the two oxygen. The OO bond, the oxygen oxygen bond, well, what's that going to be? Okay, the electronegativity of oxygen is extremely high, but so is the other oxygen. So it's 3.44 minus 3.44. What is the difference of electronegativity? The difference is zero. And of course, if it's zero, well, that puts it right there. It's a nonpolar covalent. So anytime you have two of the same molecule, doesn't it have to be a difference of zero? So that, you don't even have to really look up the number. And so nonpolar covalent. So this would be a nonpolar covalent bond. I'm just writing nonpolar right here. And of course, if you only have nonpolar bonds, then the molecule is nonpolar. You can't have polarity on the ends if all the bonds are nonpolar. Okay? So that is the oxygen. And for some of these, you're going to have to disassemble them. Okay? Take them apart to build some of the next ones. But for now, I'll just leave that. Okay, I'll just leave it there. You can't always build all of them um, with the materials that we have right here, so you might have to disassemble it. Okay, so there's the oxygen. Put it off to there. The next one is hydrogen, okay, H2. Well, not too much you could do with this. There's one hydrogen, there's two hydrogen. Okay, what can I do? Well, it's got a 
use that unpaired electron. It's got to stabilize. The only way to stabilize, well, hydrogen doesn't want an octet. It just wants to be like helium. It just wants two. And now doesn't it have two? Yes, because that counts as two electrons for this one and two electrons for this one. We're counting it twice. So now they have their duet. They have a noble gas electron configuration, like helium. All right, this one. And this one is pretty easy to show with the ball and stick. This also uses yellow for hydrogen. Hydrogen can only make one bond, so they only have one available place for the stick, and then hydrogen bonds. So you probably can tell the Vesper form. Think about what the Vesper form is. This is probably the easiest Lewis, this is the easiest Lewis structure of all. Take two hydrogen and then put them next to each other and show the bond. Pretty easy, remember. Don't forget to erase electrons that go into the bond or just write it again. If you want to do it twice, you could do a little Lewis structure here. Just draw each one next to each other and then draw it again with the bond. I want to see the bonds. Don't give me the one that doesn't show the bonds. I will not accept that as correct, okay? So hydrogen, all right, that's an easy one. Now, let's put that aside. And the next one we're gonna do is water, H2O. So let's see, uh, well, we need those hydrogen again. Why don't I just use the same ones? And we need one of these oxygen. So how are those gonna come together? This is not a really hard one. Um, how are they gonna come together? Well, let's see. You could, not many choices here. This one's not a hard one. Okay, this one's not a hard one. Put those on, and boom. So what we get there is a little water molecule, okay? A little water molecule, which you kind of should have expected. We talked about how it looks like a Mickey Mouse head. Well, this is with the space filling model. This is showing the bonds, and these, are, these sort of represent the inner atoms here, and these would be, the bonds would be the valence electrons connecting them. Um, Remember, this looks like a Mickey Mouse head, unless you turn it upside down, of course. And it's, a, got, it's got a unique shape. Is this linear? Would you call this linear, straight line? Okay, no, so don't, make sure to double check what you would call that. And then, of course, the Vesper form. Don't forget to give the Vesper form. And then for the Lewis structure, make it just like this. Put the oxygen in the middle, okay? And then put the hydrogen on the sides, and then figure out a way to give them all a noble gas configuration. For oxygen, it needs an octet. For hydrogen, it needs a duet, okay? And then with these models, with these models, okay, we've got oxygen, two hydrogen. So, okay, let's put that one on. Let's put that one on. And that one on. So remember, with these models, Oxygen is red, so there's that, or if you want it, a Mickey Mouse shape, okay, if you want it to have that shape. Okay, so there is water. So what about the polarity of these bonds? Well, there's more than one bond here, but this is the same kind of bond this one is. They're both between oxygen and hydrogen. So between hydrogen and oxygen, the hydrogen-oxygen bond, all you have to do is find their electronegativities, subtract, and then look on chart to see whether it's polar or nonpolar. So you would give me polar or nonpolar just once for the HO bond, and then you have to think about if the molecule is polar. Well, if the bond is polar, then the molecule, would it be polar? Would it cancel out? Are these two bonds exactly opposite each other, exactly opposite? Okay, would they, can, would they cancel out? You have to think about that. If they would, then it would be a nonpolar molecule. If they don't, then it would be a polar molecule. Okay, so that's water. Now let's just take H2O and add another O. Well, where can I put this? Well, I've got to take off one of these in order to put it on. Okay, and then um, let's see here. Um, now I can put the hydrogen back on. So you might think, oh, okay. H2O2, we call this 
hydrogen peroxide, you might think this is right. But look, wouldn't, why does a molecule have its shape? Think about this. Remember that electrons don't like each other. They find each other repulsive. So yes, these pairs of electrons are pushing apart. And so are the other pairs that you can't see here. But actually, aren't these pairs also repelling? So if these pairs are repelling, wouldn't they try to get as far apart from each other as they possibly could? And so what you wind up getting is what I like to call an unwound molecule, where even these pairs are as far apart as they can get. Okay? So don't just think about adjacent bonds. Think about all the bonds if you have a longer molecule. And this sort of has like a zigzag shape. And you can think about which Vesper form that would be. Okay? You could sort of describe this based on the letter. Let's see, what letter does that look like? What letter does that look like? You can describe it by a letter. Okay, so let me turn this one into... Let me turn this one... Let me turn this one also into hydrogen peroxide, add another oxygen, and again, remember that these would repel, and we can twist it that way, get them farther apart, and you wind up with this sort of zigzag shape, okay? So hydrogen peroxide, this doesn't look right. This doesn't look so great, and that's true. Um, this is not very stable. Hydrogen peroxide has to be stored out of the sunlight, out of the heat, in those brown bottles, because even a little bit of sunlight will break this apart and then it will go back to being what it wants to be, water. This is much better off for the oxygen. Okay, Oxygen would much prefer to be sort of beating up on two hydrogen than it would on an oxygen. So now for this one, well we already calculated the hydrogen-oxygen bond, so you can take whatever you had there and use it again and now we have an oxygen-oxygen bond, okay, which we've actually seen before. Oh yeah, we have that in this one. So we can just use it again, whatever it was there. Oh, it says nonpolar, nonpolar there. By the way, if there's a nonpolar bond and some of the other bonds might be polar, well then you can sort of ignore that when considering the polarity. Just try to figure out if the polar bonds cancel, and then that's hydrogen peroxide. For the remaining molecules on this sheet, I'm going to do them, just build them for you, and then I'll let you remember to do all the other stuff. I'm not going to explain every time. You should get the point by now. Okay, so I'm going to take these apart. The next one we're making is going to be carbon dioxide, CO2. So we need a carbon, and we need two oxygen. Okay, so let's see, how do these go together? Well, let's try attaching a carbon to an oxygen. Okay, and then maybe let's attach that oxygen to the other oxygen. Uh, maybe not. So this is the sort of thing students do when they're putting it together. They try one thing, and then they try another. Let's try putting the oxygen on the carbon as well. Those are too far apart to bond. Um, but look at this. So many unpaired electrons. So many of these pegs, the unpaired electrons, that's not good. So then we've got to keep working on it. We can make a double bond. Oh yeah, between these guys, right? So that takes care of this oxygen. This oxygen's all set now. Uh, nothing else is. Oh yeah, can't these make a double bond as well? Yes, they can. So this is the structure for carbon dioxide. Kind of pretty, right? Kind of neat. Okay, let me get this on right. Interesting, interesting. I'm going to build this also with the other models. Okay, I'm going to build it really quickly. Remember, with these models, oxygen is red. So I'm going to build it with these models. And we have to use the springs because we know there's going to be a double bond. So why mess around? And then let's just put this one on there. Interesting. So where this is connected is sort of in between those two bonds, right? And then... Where the other one is connected winds up being directly between the other two bonds. Interesting. And so what we wind up getting, it might be harder to see with this little one, is we wind up getting a really interesting shape, isn't it? Very interesting shape. Notice the straightening effect 
that these double bonds have. Okay, because the middle between these two bonds is right there. The middle between these two bonds is right there. Those points are exactly opposite each other, which winds up straightening out the molecule. You can see that with this one as well. Okay, if I hold it straight up, it might be easier to see. If I hold it straight toward the camera. Okay, so notice that it does line up. So that's the straightening effect of double bonds or of multiple bonds. Okay, so this is carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide, think about if it's stable, think about the Vesper form, measure the polarity. Whatever the polarity is between these bonds, whatever this one is, will be the same as that one. Okay? And then determine the polarity of the molecule, etc., and the Lewis structure, but make sure to put carbon in the middle when you're doing the Lewis structure. Okay. Oh yeah, by the way, what about carbon monoxide? There's a question about carbon monoxide. Well, what would carbon monoxide look like? It would be kind of like this, but missing one of these. Well, you wouldn't have a, a bond to nowhere, so take those off. Huh, that looks weird. And again, take off an oxygen, you wouldn't have bonds to nowhere. Ooh, you can really, harder to see here that those are those holes. Those represent where you have to make a bond to have an octet. But easier to see here are those pegs. That's not good. So that is a radical that is not stable. That's why carbon monoxide doesn't last very long in the atmosphere. Okay, It pretty much wants to get another oxygen. So carbon monoxide, by the way, is toxic to us. Our body takes it in through the air, treats it like oxygen, but it can't use it like oxygen in our blood, so it's a problem. Okay, it can cause asphyxiation. Not a good one to have around. So carbon monoxide, it says, think about why it wouldn't last in the atmosphere too long. So that's pretty easy. Okay, the next one is HCN. Okay, HCN. So I'll keep the carbon there. And then what do we need? We need an H, that's hydrogen. We need carbon and a nitrogen. Ooh, putting these together should be fun. Three different colors. Okay, so if I do that, I think I'll just put the hydrogen on first because we can get that taken care of in one fell swoop. I guess I could have put the hydrogen onto the nitrogen, but, okay, maybe I have too much knowledge about the way these behave, but let's try to link the nitrogen. Now they're all linked together, but is that going to be stable? Is that looking good? Definitely not. Remember, even one of these pegs is a big problem. Having four of them, forget about it, okay? That would not exist in nature, okay? So we got to keep working with these toys. Okay, remember, we're playing with toys, so this is a little bit fun. It's basically trial and error. You see if it works one way, if it doesn't. And then the interesting thing about this is, for the most part, what you get from this process, oh yeah, we can make a, a triple bond there. Look, you can actually take care of both of those, so it kind of works out. What you get from this process is actually the real shape of the molecule, oftentimes. Now, this one is not a good one to have around. I'll talk about it while I'm building... Uh, while I'm building it over here, let me put the nitrogen onto the carbon. Now this, carbon and nitrogen, CN, okay, which is what we call a polyatomic ion, is, a, is what we call cyanide. CN is cyanide. That is a toxic chemical. Oh, but it, carbon doesn't have its octet completed, so add the hydrogen right there. So this is hydrogen cyanide. This is a deadly gas. So you don't want to have this around you. I mean, obviously the model isn't a problem, but having this actual chemical around you, but doesn't it have an interesting shape? Isn't it interesting how these sort of line up? Okay, and that's because the triple bond, okay, if you think about where the triple bond is, it's located between three of the bonds. So then the remaining bond must be on completely the other side. So triple bonds have a tendency to straighten out molecules to make them much, much straighter than they would otherwise be. And you may have noticed that with carbon dioxide because it also, the double bonds tend to straighten out molecules as well. So both of them have a tendency to straighten out molecules. So who would have thought that taking these and putting them together would wind up making something that was a straight line? So notice the straightening effect of multiple bonds. Again, this time it's a triple bond and the middle between those three bonds is right there, and that's exactly opposite the remaining single bond. 
So they are opposite each other, which is why, notice, this lines up in a straight line. Okay, you can see it with this one as well. Okay, so that is another one, another example of the straightening out effect that those multiple bonds have. And then don't forget to calculate the polarity of these bonds. The next one we're doing is nitrogen. So nitrogen is N2. So there's one nitrogen. There's two nitrogen atoms. So we've got to make, figure out how to get these together. Well, this isn't too hard. So let's see. Let's connect them. Obviously, those unpaired electrons go into that bond. But this is definitely not okay. So then we've got to make a second bond. You can see where this is going because, of course, every nitrogen needs three more electrons. Well, doesn't that mean that it could also satisfy that with three bonds or a triple bond? So look at the nitrogen. So take a look at that one. Now, doesn't that look pretty tough, pretty hard to break? So now I'm going to build it out of the wooden models. Notice that nitrogen with the wood models, of course, is blue. And I'm going to build this a little bit faster. Notice how I'm not explaining as much as we go on. I'm figuring you don't need me to explain it that many times. Okay, so just remember you should be doing all of those things, all of those things for each one. And then there's a nice double bond. So one of the questions is, why is nitrogen difficult for us to obtain from the atmosphere? Well, look, can you see why? Why is that so hard for us to sort of break apart, to take into our system? We need nitrogen, and it's all around us, but look at that. Okay, don't you think that that would be a tricky bond to try to break? It just looks strong. So it does look a little bit chintzy with these straws, yes, because the way it bends, but remember that a triple bond really is shorter. It really does draw them closer together. Okay, notice the length of the single bond. Okay, notice compared to the triple, it would separate them much, much further. Okay, so a triple bond is shorter, which means stronger. The next one is N2O. Oh, so I can leave the nitrogen bonded together. Okay, we have two nitrogen, and I can do the same thing with this one. Let me leave them connected. And then I've just got to bring in an, oh, an oxygen. So now where am I going to put this oxygen with these ones? Let's see this one first. Well, I can attach it right there. And then, oh, I can attach it, um, I can attach it to that one. Okay. And let's see, what else can we do with this? Oh, well, these each need another bond and they can provide it to each other. So this looks pretty good, right? Doesn't that look good? Once I put this on, doesn't that look like that's fine and dandy? Let me build it out of the other one as well. Okay, it even stands up. We can even make it stand up vertically. Okay, so the only problem with this situation is that you can make this out of a model, but that's not exactly how it really turns out in the real world. Okay, so the problem with some of these models will not accurately, it comes out the same way with both of them. Okay, so you can look at it this way. You could look at it this way. Um, the thing is, sometimes models won't show the accurate structure of a molecule. And this is an example. I wanted you to do at least one where it wasn't the real structure, just so you could see that there was a limitation to this. Because sometimes in chemistry, we don't exactly have a single bond, and we don't exactly have a double bond. We have some sort of resonance between them. Okay? Or we don't exactly have a double or a triple. We have some sort of resonance between them. And you can't really show that with a molecule model very easily. There actually are times you can, but in this case you can't. So really, this is not what the true molecule looks like, but still draw it like this. Uh, draw it like this on here and see if you can handle the Lewis structure. This actually has the hardest Lewis structure on this whole assignment, but give it a shot. I just want to see if you could try to guess it. Remember, there's two, uh, two of the nitrogen and one of the oxygen. See if you can get them to mesh up together to make a Lewis structure. And again, even though I'm not mentioning it every time, you got to make sure to do the Lewis structures. You want to do the full battery of things for each one. I'm just not mentioning it each time. And also you want to find the polarity of the nitrogen oxygen bond. Okay. And so now what's the next one? I got to flip it over the next one, CH4. 
Okay, well, there's carbon. And then H4, that means four hydrogen. One, two, three, four. Well, that's fine because hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. Pretty easy to come by, so that shouldn't be a problem. I can see exactly what to do here. Usually this one doesn't trip up students. They can immediately see, boom, boom, boom. This is exactly what the carbon needs. The carbon needs to make four bonds. Each hydrogen needs to make one bond. And what you get is perfection. Okay, so look at that. And again, it stands up. So this, of course, I've already said the name of it earlier, should be an easier one for the Vesper form and structure. Okay, and pay attention that the distance between these two is the same as the distance between these two. It's the same as the distance here, same as the distance here. Everywhere between any two of these bonds, it's the same distance apart. Interesting. Okay, which is why, as we saw, if you have a double bond on this side, it's the middle between these two. A double bond on this side, it's the middle between these two, which winds up straightening them out. Okay, but this one, of course, is not straightened out. This is your classic structure for a molecule. So make sure that you get this one right. And then I'm going to build the same thing with my, I'm going to build the same thing over here, taking four hydrogen and a carbon. They use the same color for both in this case. And boom. Okay, so this is one you really need to know. This is sort of the stereotype of a molecule. This is a very, very important. This one is called methane, CH4. And make sure to get its structure, but pay attention. Look at those angles. Beautiful. Okay, this is kind of a really, really cool structure. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so that's CH4. That was an easy one. And then, of course, all you have to do is the bond between carbon and hydrogen, and all of these are the same. So is it polar or nonpolar? And then you can determine for the whole molecule. Okay, the next one is quite a bit harder. C6H6. Oh, boy. So I might have to take some other ones apart to get that much. Let me leave the hydrogen there. That's four of them. Now we need two more. I guess I'll just put them all onto, put them all onto straws just to get them ready. Okay. Total of six carbons, six hydrogen. Now, it says, and this is important, it says, hint, try to make a ring. A ring, like on your finger, is a circle. So we're going to try to make a circle. Well, these are never going to make a circle. Because, like, if you bonded these together, it make a straight line. So let's make the circle out of these, and then we'll add those. Okay, so a circle of carbon. Da, 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 da. Many students have trouble with this one. So let me show you some of the things that they sometimes do here. Okay, They make a circle of carbon. These. Circle. Not exactly circular. It's more like what shape? What shape would you call that? What's it looking like? In a honeycomb? What's that honeycomb pattern? That we see a lot in nature. Need a tighter straw. What's that honeycomb pattern that we see frequently in nature? Okay. With six sides, what's a six-sided shape? Okay. It is a hexagon. And then what I get students doing is sometimes they put one of these on here, and then well maybe they put two on there. Okay. And then like this, you can make it kind of pretty kind of symmetrical like this. I've seen things sort of like that, which is pretty cool. It looks kind of cool, very symmetrical. But the only problem is every one of these unpaired electrons, okay, every one of these, remember carbon needs to make four bonds in order to have an octet. So this is very unstable. So then what I've seen students come up with is stuff like this, like going from this one to that one, like things like that. I've, I've seen many like variations on this where they've said, oh, okay, well, these could triple bond. And then if they triple bond, and they've come up with weird structures. Now, some of the structures, not this one, some of the structures really exist, but that's not what we're looking for here. This is a particular molecule. 
This molecule is called benzene, and we don't want to cross this ring. Keep it as a ring. So the way to do it is we've got to, first of all, um, take off the second hydrogen from each of those. And then let's see, is there a way to satisfy, is there a way to satisfy the octet of this carbon? Yes, there is. Couldn't it just double bond with this carbon? Okay, oh, okay. And then we've got a peg there for a hydrogen. Great. So now these two are taken care of. And then what about this one? Is there a way to satisfy this? Oh yeah, couldn't it double bond with this carbon, like so? And then, oh, we could stick a hydrogen on there and satisfy that one. So now look, boom, 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 those are satisfied. Ooh, we're getting close. But now, what do we need? Well, this one can make another bond. You could get a multiple bond here, a double bond between these carbons. And add the last hydrogen. And boom, if this connects, this is what we call a benzene ring. This is a real molecule, a really cool molecule. This molecule is found all over the place. Okay, so now I'm going to build the other bigger model, and then we'll talk more about the benzene ring. Notice it's a ring, well, it's a hexagon, but it looks kind of circular. Okay, so here's what we need for the benzene ring. I'm just going to put them on there so they don't roll away. Um, I think I have enough. Um, yeah, I should have enough. Okay, so notice if we bond the carbon together, Notice that we have a single bond followed by a double bond. We don't see two single bonds in a row, so I guess I'll put springs onto this one in order to connect it to the next carbon. So that would be like this part right there. And then, oh yeah, I'm gonna need springs on this one to connect to the next carbon. Okay, I'm gonna have to have springs on this one to show the double bond to connect to this next carbon, right, and then after the double bond, you have a single bond. Oh, I see, it's alternating. Double bond, sorry, single bond, double bond, single bond. What do you think happens next? Follow the pattern, okay? And then on this one, we had single bond, double bond, and then this is going to be a single bond, okay? And then these have to double bond Oh, did I grab an extra, I grabbed an extra carbon. Okay, uh, these have to double bond to each other. So once we have this made into a nice, neat ring, we just have to add all the hydrogen here. So now notice, this is kind of cool, six carbons linked together, and this is actually possible to show you resonance, actually, because resonating would just be like this be going back and forth between these. So what really winds up happening in this ring is that the valence electrons are shared around all of these carbon and they wind up going around and around in a circle so it has interesting properties. But now I've got to add the hydrogen to truly make it benzene. This is an example of a hydrocarbon. I just put one hydrogen on each one like a little factory here and notice that now I have a benzene ring. Now, benzene rings are very, very common. They're very, very common, and they occur in a lot of aromatic chemicals, chemicals that have a strong smell or flavor, things you can uh, easily detect. So there's a lot of benzene rings. Um, and you'll see that this is a very common pattern. This is a very common structure that carbon forms. So here's the small scale version, small scale version of the benzene ring, and the large scale, and again, you can see the resonance just by rotating it by 60 degrees, right? Just by rotating it, that's the resonance forms. Okay, so I told you that one had resonance. I wasn't planning on doing that, oops. Okay, now, that's a pretty hard one. The last one is not this hard. The last one's kind of easy. Okay. Oh, by the way, for Vesper form, for these, you just have to think of what would it be. It's not given on the sheets, it's not on here but you can think about what it would be and what you would call, what would you call this shape, right? Okay, the next one is NH3 ammonia. Okay, so remember that nitrogen is this, and do I have any hydrogen left? 
I'll take some of the hydrogen off of this. I'll just take them with the straws. How about that? And, oh, this is pretty easy. Boom, boom, boom. So, just stick them on. And NH3, this is a very common chemical. Okay, so it's almost like that tetrahedron, but it's like missing its top. It's like missing the top of the tetrahedron. Okay, so this stands up. Notice that it rises off my hand, if you can see that. And now let me build the bigger model. Maybe, maybe it'll be more obvious. So remember, with the, these ones, nitrogen is actually blue. That's why they've given it the right number of bonds for nitrogen, which of course needs to make three bonds to satisfy its octet. Nitrogen, of course, needs to make three bonds to satisfy its octet. And so again, this rises up in the middle. This is not flat. Okay, there's very few molecules that remain flat on a surface when they have this many atoms. Um, only the ones built around boron actually do that. So this is not planar. This is not like flat on this paper. This rises up. You can sort of see by the shadow there probably. You can see that this rises up. Okay. If it was planar, if it was planar, it would stay flat on the surface. So see what I mean? So this one, think of the Vesper form and think of what it's called. Don't forget there's a pair of electrons here. Remember those? That pair of electrons is still there. So that's one of the things we indicate in our Vesper form. And then it says, why can't nitrogen hold four hydrogen? Well, here it's holding three. So why can't it hold four? Think about it. Don't forget to answer those little questions there. So that's enough for you to draw the molecules. Don't forget to do the Lewis structures. Don't forget to give me the stability. That's super easy. Pretty much almost all of them will be stable, by the way. Okay, I'd be very surprised if you had more than one that was unstable. Or even if you had one, think about it. Do you have any that are unstable? And then very stable, multiple bonds. Don't forget to give me the Vesper form. And then the polarity. Well, these are all the same bonds. So just do the polarity of one of them, the NH bond, and then tell me, is the whole molecule polar as well? Okay? So please uh, complete all this. Don't forget to answer the questions. And that is the molecule models assignment.